War stories, whether the stuff of memoir or fictional portrayals of people at war, are mainstays of literature across human history. And today that extends to film. Today's guest is both a historian and a veteran who seizes on the power of modern storytelling in film to educate the next generation about the realities of war. He's Dr. Mark Jacobson this week on Story in the Public Square. And welcome to a story in the public square where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, scholars, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Dr. Mark R. Jacobson, who's the John J. McCloy Professor of American Institutions and International Diplomacy at Amherst College. Mark, it's great to see you. Good to see you, Jim. So, you know, you and I have known each other for almost 20 years now. Uh, and one of the things that I've always admired about you is your commitment not just to studying history, uh, but also to really uh, uh, immersing yourself in the experience of, of, of people that you uh, are studying. So uh, you're, you're a military historian. Uh, but in graduate school, you decided to join the United States Army. I, I did. I, enlist yeah. uh, in the United States Army. So tell us about that. So I, you know, I've been fascinated with military history since I was a kid. I, I think uh, my, my uh, family would tell you that uh, I could tell you the order of battle uh, at Midway before I could even walk. Uh, but but, but, I, but on, a, on a more serious note, it, it was really my father reading to me um, uh, a story, uh, Robert Leckie's story of World War II, kind of a you know, kind of a young adults book, and I made him read the Pearl Harbor chapter over and over and over again. But of course, you know, it's only after September 11, 2001, do you look back and realize, wait, I've had a defining moment like that as well. Yeah. But but to go back, I was always fascinated with military history. I decided uh, as an undergrad, I wanted to teach military history. I wanted to go to grad school, get my my doctorate. But about a year in, I realized that I'm here with individuals who have 10, 15 years of work experience. They've worked in the Army. They've worked at CIA out in the private sector. And they really understand uh, not just the, the history itself, but how to write about history, uh, what it really means, how to understand what these people went through. And, and after speaking with my advisors, I, I realized that I need to do something else, uh, maybe go out into the private sector, uh, maybe go into government service. And while I was thinking about that, I read uh, a piece by uh, a young army captain, and it was entitled, Those Who Fight and Those Who Decide. And it was all about his time at Georgetown School of Foreign Service and dealing with people who wanted to go into international affairs but really didn't understand the military. And that made me realize if I want to be one of those people who may have to make decisions one day about sending young men and women to battle, then I need to fight myself. I need to go in and understand what it's like. And I did it from the ground up. You uh, enlisted. Year? Enlisted. What year was that that you enlisted? That was 1993. So we still had <laughs> targets that had red stars on them. And all the, <laughs> all the cadences were about killing commies. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, it's the, it's the end of, the, of the, uh, the Cold War. You still kind of have that um, uh, lingering on. But at the same time, uh, just as I enlisted, um, we had uh, the Battle of Mogadishu. Uh, where the 19 Rangers uh, and Special Operations Forces were killed. So for those of us, we were like, well, wait, there is a world out there where we might be asked to go into a situation and might have to give our lives for our country. So it was deadly serious um, for, for us. At so that time. you, you, uh, you did a, your first uh, overseas deployment into a war zone into Bosnia uh, as part of the stabilization force. Yeah, the I-4 and S-4 campaigns, 1996, 1997, mm -hmm. and that that brought reality pretty quick to you. I mean, it's not kinetic. The danger was landmines. But um, as an aside, one of my advisors in graduate school, the late Joe Krusel, had been a deputy assistant secretary of defense at the Pentagon working the Balkans issues um, and had been killed on, at Mount Igman in 1995. Um, 
uh, w when his uh, armored personnel carrier slid off uh, the cliff. So, so this was a very personal to me uh, that um, we needed to go in, keep the peace aggressively if necessary, mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, it was formative in terms of, of my own personal uh, outlook on international affairs, on my own maturity, my own way of looking at the world. I want to come back to that in a second, but you later uh, take a, a commission uh, because of a, a Navy program, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, called Green, Green, Green to, Blue, to Blue, right? Uh, um, it's, uh, it's actually the DCO, the Direct Commission Officer Program. So but you, you Green to Blue is about right. You took a commission yeah. as a U.S. Naval officer, right. uh, and it was as a U.S. Navy officer that you deployed to Afghanistan in 2006. That's correct. All right. Yeah. So how does that experience of actually serving in harm's way uh, change you as a scholar, change you as a professor in the classroom? So, a, a couple things. So one, uh, you, you actually get to tell stories. Uh, you know, <laughs> as, as, you joke, as people joke, now you have war stories and lies and, um, to tell. So, but, uh, you know, it's an understanding of, you know, we can, we, in the academic world, we can start talking about Clausewitz and Jomini and Mahan and theory and strategy and all that, but, but what about war? for those people on the ground. And not just the frontline combat experience, but what about the experience of being bored, being sit sitting back? I mean, there were times in Bosnia we were bored. What do soldiers do when they're bored? They get into trouble. Um, you know, what happens when you're responsible for sending people out and they're killed or injured? You know, that, that changes people. It also changes the way you look at history. And for me, uh, it did two things. First. I started to look at military history from the ground up. What is it like for the individual serving? You know, not as much worried about the four-star generals and the strategy and the policy, but what's it like on the ground? And the second piece is being able to relate to a, a more diverse set of students. And I mean that because I grew up in a nice upper middle class neighborhood in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan, but in the military, you're meeting people you know, who grew up dirt poor, uh, people who had never been outside their own state, much less outside their own country. And it teaches you a bit you know, about how to relate to folks like that, how to lead, how to manage, um, and how to bring out stories in history that might relate to them, not just ones that would relate to me. So you were in the military at, during the time of 9-11? Correct. I was a reservist uh, at the time of 9-11 and a civilian in the Pentagon that, that day. You, you, you're, you're sort of glossing over a little bit, though. You, I mean, the, the Flight 77 went into your wing of the Pentagon. You know, we were, uh, uh, as I recall, about 120 feet from impact, um, close enough uh, to make it unforgettable, uh, far enough away that we were lucky uh, that no one in our office uh, was killed. Were you there? I was there at the time. Uh, it was, uh, you know, not to walk through the entire day, but I, I was actually a little bit late into work. I heard about the first uh, aircraft on the radio. Uh, my sister, who uh, was at the time a reporter out in Sacramento, I called her up, we have, what, 5.30 in the morning or so, said, you need to get up and run into the station. And I have to tell you, I, I still remember the chill that went up my spine. I had no, there was no doubt in my mind this was a terrorist incident. And frankly, those of us who had been, I had just finished a rotation working counterterrorism issues. You know, by, the, by nine o'clock, you know, there was no doubt in our mind that it had to be someone associated with Al Qaeda. You know, Bin Laden. Uh, we had had the, the, uh, a couple of um, incidents in the years before that had raised awareness, but you know, certainly no one understood the import of it until later in the day. Um, and I was very lucky uh, that I wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. So you deployed later after 9-11 to yes. Afghanistan, is that correct? Yes, I uh, was mobilized in 2006. Uh, I, from the reserves. From the reserves. Had yeah. a very interesting job uh, where um, I got to work with some of the more senior commanders, which would, would play a role in my civilian job later on. But, but I went over as uh, an intelligence officer, uh, specifically a human intelligence officer. My job is to, to go out there and uh, listen to people, collect information, but, but not like a spy. I'm, I'm not covert. I'm, I'm overt uh, in a true name, mm -hmm. in a uniform, uh, although sometimes the uniform looked like this. There was a little longer beard. <laughs> and, um, and frankly, the, the Afghans I spoke with were more interested in the fact that uh, I had worked on Capitol Hill and worked at the Pentagon uh, as a civilian. 
uh, rather than me as a reservist. But uh, I, I had the chance to work with uh, General Sir David Richards, who was the British uh, four-star commander at the time, uh, Lieutenant General, General, later Ambassador Carl Eikenberry. Um, but again, it was, you know, I had my management roles, I had my teams around the country, I had a wonderful uh, boss who was a Marine Corps colonel who had been serving in the Marine Corps since he was a young enlisted, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a young staff sergeant during the Vietnam War. So it was, again, uh, probably, uh, again, you know, I, I came back uh, relatively unscathed, uh, no, no physical injuries, and, uh, but it, again, it was one of the things I'm proudest of in, in terms of uh, my professional career. Well, so now you're a professor of history at Amherst College where you teach a course titled The American Experience of War Through Literature and Film. Yes. So what are you trying to accomplish in that course? So uh, again, to take you back a little bit, uh, Professor Jerry Linderman at the University of Michigan uh, in the 80s and 90s used to teach a course called The American Experience of War. And we read memoirs and novels and diaries from the Civil War through Vietnam. I mean, that's all, all there was. You entered in Vietnam yeah. at this time. And I wanted to redo that course for the 21st century undergraduate student. So not just take uh, the novels and fiction from World War II and Vietnam, I mean, the, the classic literature of Vietnam, Philip Caputo's Rumor of War, mm -hmm. Linda Vandevanter's Home Before Morning, but now we have a generation of kids just a little older than you who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you can read their memoirs, you can read their fiction. Oh, and let's add to that, we now have some incredible film uh, since the late 80s uh, movies that, that really captures the essence of what it's like to go to war. And I want them to understand the, that, and not to be too uh, philosophical about it, but so that they understand what the cost of war is. It's not just an option. It's something that's going to get our young men and women killed. It's brutal, it's violent, it's grotesque. And I just think that it's important if we're going to understand the world around us that we understand that war is endemic in human history. And one of the few ways I think we can make it less likely that wars happen is to study its true costs. So what are some of the seminal war films that you teach or, or talk about in your class? So uh, I think, you know, I, I hesitate to call these the big three, but, but might as well. <laughs> I, I think uh, what's really critical is for students to, my students, is to watch Platoon, Oliver Stone's uh, wonderful right. film about the Vietnam War. Uh, and I think that's particularly important because uh, the Vietnam War, obviously a controversial war, a war that wasn't black and white like World War II. You think back to the movies of the 50s and 60s, even the 40s, whether it's 12 O'Clock High, uh, the propaganda films like Gung Ho from 1942, but even uh, the adaptation of Cornel Cornelius Ryan's The Longest Day, where you know, it's black and white, there, you know, John Wayne's there, uh, Robert Mitchum, you know, every, every Richard Burton, all the classic heroes, and then when people get shot, they sort of politely stumble to the ground, clutch their chest, and there's slump no blood. Over. Yeah. They slump, that, that's yeah. it. And Platoon starts this, this movement going, where let's, let's start to look at the tough ethical decisions that soldiers had to take during the Vietnam War. It's not as easy as good guy, bad, bad guy. The, the, the uh, protagonist, uh, played by Charlie Sheen, actually has to murder one of his own NCOs at the end of the film, but it, it might be justified. Um, then you have Saving Private Ryan, which I think is important for some different reasons. Um, again, comparing it back with, with The Longest Day in 1961, that scene on Omaha Beach, the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, is jarring. And my students still come up to me that that was tough to get through. Uh, the blood, uh, the gore, and again, some of this is special effects, but it's also the willingness to try and be accurate. And I think Tom Hanks has to get a great deal of credit for trying to bring uh, the, the tactical and technical accuracy of what it's like. And you hear veterans talk about that piece, and they say that it's um, absolutely critical. Uh, and the third one also for the Second World War, I make my students watch Band of Brothers. Uh, I think it's one of the great series uh, in terms of understanding small unit leadership, uh, you can see that you know, bad things will happen to good people, um, but I, I think it captures more so than any other uh, modern film or series uh, the essence of war. And I, I, I would, um, would add one other thing. I actually let them watch the HBO series or ask them to watch the HBO series Generation Kill. 
Um, there's not a lot of good stuff out there, not a lot of good movies out there about Iraq and Afghanistan, but HBO's series Generation Kill is, is, is I wanted one. to ask you about that. Is, do you think that that's just a function of time? I mean, we're, so we're still, we're still in Afghanistan. We still have some forces in Iraq. Is it simply that we don't have the perspective yet to tell these stories or, 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 or what? Well, there, there's a couple things. To be cynical, Hollywood hasn't figured out how to monetize that yet. Um, you know, you have some films by the Hurt, uh, like uh, Bigelow's The Hurt Locker. Mm -hmm. It's not great. Veterans don't tend to like that film. Um, what, why not? They don't find it realistic at okay. all. Uh, they, they find some of this stuff a little bit outlandish. Uh, the idea of someone going rogue to that degree bothers them. So it doesn't um, seem accurate to them. No, and, okay. I, and I think that's, that's difficult. The second is, you know, these are not clean black and white wars either. Uh, yeah. In the case of, of Afghanistan, we go in for, for the right reasons. Iraq, we go in for the wrong reasons. Afghanistan's not finished, and I think, yeah, it gets to your point. Uh, it's like making uh, the Green Berets, uh, John Wayne the Green Berets. That hasn't held up real well, yeah. and it's seen as a propaganda film. Um, you know, you have some people who've tried to write stories about their own experiences, and I, th I think, you know, I, I, it's not a perfect analogy, but almost like wine. You know, people's memories haven't uh, really matured enough uh, to make their stories, uh, uh, I, I think, adaptable to make great films. You have some, you, know, you had the first round of memoirs that was done, uh, you know, 05, 06, 07. Uh, Kayla Williams, Love My Rifle More Than You. Uh, uh, Nate Fick, uh, and uh, Nate Fick's book. Um, uh, you know, you have those, but now you have a second generation. You also have, you know, things like by C.J. Shivers uh, or Elliot Ackerman. Um, Ashley's yeah, War. Ashley's War, uh, Gail Lemon's study mm -hmm. of, of the, the uh, cultural support teams. But, and, and again, you have Ashley's War being made into a, a film now. Uh, you have M.J. Hagar's uh, story about her. You know, she was the first woman to receive the Distinguished Flying Cross since Amelia Earhart. So we're getting the stories of individuals. But I don't think anyone's ready to capture the war itself. It will be the stories that take place within the war. But even then, I, I'm just not sure the American public... Um, is going to jump on those just yet. You know, we need our, you know, what's going to be the uh, apocalypse now that comes out four or five years after the war has ended? Well, I mean, like, kind you of think about sort of like the way, the, the role that these, that these conflicts play in American popular culture right now, and I think of video game series like mm -hmm. uh, Call of Duty, which sort of stumbled on sort of the giving um, players the opportunity to play the Taliban. Right. Right. Um, it, 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 almost, you know, World War II has sort of a, a cultural touchstone role in American, in American public life. That so when whether it's Band of Brothers or Saving Private Ryan, you know, you you just automatically almost hear the sort of that sound of that solitary trumpet, and it's sort of martial and invigorating. I don't think that America is ready to tell those kinds of stories yet about Iraq and Afghanistan. I also think that the American public, to their credit, and, and certainly people who follow this, whether it's journalists or, or uh, uh, scholars, realize that um, you know, just as we had the myth of the good war with World War II, you know, there was a myth of the good war in Afghanistan, the war of necessity, and the war of choice. But both of them still have a lot of bad things that happen. I mean, mm -hmm. what, you know, we look at the situation with Sergeant Bales and the, the, the massacre of Afghan civilians. Uh, we've had, you know, hell of a lot of war crimes uh, committed there as well. And so I think that veneer is much thinner than it was. I mean, if we're objective and go back to World War II, let's start studying all the things that took place there that weren't quite, uh, uh, you know, weren't quite right uh, in, in the way the U.S. Uh, uh, had to deal with uh, German and, and Japanese uh, uh, prisoners um, and you know, the firebombing of, of the cities in, in Germany and Japan. Well, you know, in my view, justified. Um, I think that there's been a much thinner veneer on the wars here. Uh, and so I just don't think people are ready to, to watch them in, ser in terms of um, uh, fictionalizing it for the, for the screen. Despite these movies that, that we're talking about here, despite the literature, there are still people in the American public who have the John Wayne version of what war is. Good guys, bad guys. The good guys win, the bad guys lose. America wins. Why do you think that is? They don't read enough. I mean, this is exactly what my students pick up in the literature, uh, whether we are... Uh, looking at, you know, you look at Sledge uh, with the old breed during the you Second World War. Yeah. Go back, I don't just have them read, uh, you know, remarks all quiet on the rest Western Front. Again, not focused on the U.S., but, yeah. you know, that's what most folks read in high school. I make them read Sebastian Junger's Storm of Steel. So they see a, a cold-hearted German warrior uh, who you, you probably don't like by the end. 
Um, you've got some wonderful Vietnam literature, sort of the, the more recent stuff, uh, in terms of fiction. Carl Marlantis's Matterhorn and Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, which, uh, if you're familiar with the book, you're not really sure whether it's true or, or not, you know, fiction or not fiction. But you have the students read things, and there's a lot of moral ambiguity. There's great discomfort in reading these things. And, and I think it's, if you don't read this, you are going to come away and think, uh, that war is simply, we're good, they're bad, God is always on our side, and everything we do can be justified somehow. Do, do you teach or get into with your students or your writing another cost of war continuing to this day, which is veterans who come home with mental right. health issues, with economic difficulties, the number of suicides every day. Do you talk about that? I mean, that right. has been a cost that until relatively recently has been quote unquote hidden. Certainly the wor World War II generation didn't talk about that at all. But no, and I, uh, the name's can, escaping me of the, f of the film that comes out right after the Second World War uh, about... Uh, best Years of Our Lives. Best Years of Our Lives. Thank you, Jim. Um, and, and people were worried about that. And so in fact, we spend uh, the entire last quarter of the course speaking about the war after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, now, I've, you. I've tried Deer Hunter with them. Doesn't just really work for the generation, even though they recognize everybody who's in it. Yeah. You know, they forget <laughs> it's an Academy Award winning film. Yeah. Uh, uh, the story of Ron Kovic, born on the 4th of July, does seem to work with them. Uh -huh. um, there's a uh, more recent Miles Teller film, and, and they, that's their generation, um, called Thank You for Your Service, an mm -hmm. adaptation of a, of a very good memoir. Uh, and that, that they can relate to, and it's about Afghanistan and Iraq. And even though the, uh, the, the script is a bit uh, oh, uh, sort of moralistic, uh, you, know, you get the approach that, look, the, the bureaucracy isn't going to do anything for you. Uh, you have uh, the, the company commander who says, suck it up uh, when you truly have troubled kids who, who need some help. So we spend some time on that. We spend a lot of time with Sebastian Junger's uh, uh, discussions about veterans and, and why veterans miss war. And we talk about that as well. And then, of course, uh, some wonderful documentaries uh, that we're able to, uh, where you have and Vietnam veterans. So, you know, I, we, we talk on the show a lot, obviously, about the, the, the power of storytelling. Right. Is there a danger, though, as a historian, is there a danger in, in, in teaching history with fictionalized accounts, with, with, with Hollywood blockbusters that... Um, maybe don't have the same imperative for historical accuracy that you would from a peer-reviewed publication. Absolutely, if you're trying to understand the course of the war. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to understand uh, the struggle of, and I'll use this generically, of man, you know, the, the internal struggle, the external struggle, the struggle versus uh, the war, the, the transformation of individuals. Um, if, if you think of... Um, uh, there's uh, Samuel Fuller's wonderful film, uh, The Big Red One, from yeah. the 1980s, the transformation of the Mark Hamill character uh, from the beginning uh, through the end of the story. Then fiction is useful, um, and frankly, memoirs are useful as well. And I think one of the things I've learned over uh, the four years I've, I've taught this course at Georgetown and at Amherst is that there needs to be some greater context. I always uh, flirt with the idea of, should I have a prerequisite? You have to have taken a course on the Second World War in Vietnam. Um, to be able to talk to about To be able this. to talk about this. But what I do instead is the, the first block of instruction for each war we're dealing with, we talk a little bit about what it's like to go to war. Uh, something that did help tremendously with that uh, was the film, uh, They Shall Not Grow Old. So before I have students read about the First World War in trenches and, and watch the, uh, the Mel Gibson movie, uh, Gallipoli, um, I have them watch They Shall Not Grow Old, because so they know what a trench line looks like. Peter Jackson's incredible documentary about right. World War I. Right. So the image that some people have of the American soldier is male, white, and straight. Yes. And the reality is the armed services include many other Groups than that. Do you get into that? I do. And this actually caused a great problem for me when developing the syllabi. If I want to go and find a memoir from the Vietnam War, other than that, uh, written by a white male, it's very difficult. Um, you, have, uh, uh, you have some great audio tapes, and there was the old documentary series called Bloods that I can use, but that's not just about one African-American soldier. It's about 
the experience of black Americans during the Vietnam War. Uh, I had mentioned Linda Vandevanter's book um, about the Vietnam War. There, there are not a lot of books written by women about the Vietnam War. However, I've learned a couple things. One, you have to start digging and maybe bring out things that are not taught uh, or certainly weren't used for me in, in the courses I took as an undergrad. But the second piece is um, I've been deliberately going to try and find uh, stories, uh, whether it's uh, gay and lesbian soldiers, um, Hispanic Americans, Jewish Americans, Sikh Americans, you know, their experience, uh, and that's a little bit easier when it comes to Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I may not be able to find a literary classic, but what I want uh, to bring about uh, are two things. One, to understand that if we want to uh, accurately address the experience of soldiering or of serving the armed forces in American history, you have to look beyond white male history. Uh, and secondly, um, I want my students to understand that in some ways combat is the great equalizer. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, that experience of, of fighting is going to be the same. And, and I have to make one other point. One of the challenges too, and, and I'm guilty of this to some degree as well, when we focus on combat experience, we almost put ourselves in a funnel because of uh, you know, the American discrimination against those who are not white males and those who are not male in terms of being allowed to serve in the combat arms. Right, right forces you to only look at those. And so we're trying to break away from it. So for example, um, you know, why not, uh, again, uh, MJ Hagar is an example of this. Let's look at the memoirs of a combat search, air and rescue pilot during uh, the war in Afghanistan. Um, let's make sure that we're addressing uh, the intelligence officer who was serving behind the lines, whose story is just as important to understanding the experience of war. Let's not just focus on the SEALs and the Rangers and the Special Forces and the infantry. Otherwise, we do get a warped impression of what the experience of war for the American soldier was like. Mark, I uh, w want to thank you for this. I, I think I want to take your class. <laughs> uh, so uh, he is Mark Jacobson. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.